have you ever been, every time I try to decide what I'm going to talk about, I'm very careful on what I start studying. The reason being is God's going to test me on it. Have you ever had anything of that nature where you start doing a study and all of a sudden it hits? Well, I'm going to be talking about being doers of the word today. And uh, just even the last, if you know me, I have to have things in order. I have to have things, you know, at 10.50 we start here, at 10.51 and 30 seconds we're going to do this, and at 35 seconds we're going to do this. That's just my comfort zone. I think it's back from the farming days. My dad, and, you know, he's really instru- uh, taught us where, you know, like even the lines on the rows, it's straight. When you plow, guess what? It has to be straight. So I have to have things in line, and anytime I talk about, like, do there's a word, God always tests me on, he gets, you know, my life all juggled up to try to, you know, just the test. But even as being doers of the word and being a Christian, because it's not only being hearers of the word, but being doers, even yesterday we were going to Amarillo to, you know, eat, just to kind of mess around up in Amarillo, and we stop at a red light, heading home, and then all of a sudden I see this big plywood just fly. And of course, it hit the car behind me, tumbled and tore my uh, bed cover, and then it hit the front of my hood, and then it went in and hit two more cars. So, of course, you know, I step out, you know, make sure the guy wasn't too big, but I step out of my truck, and then uh, I look at him, and he looked a little bit skinnier and scared, so I was like, pull over. So uh, he went, and then we're pulling over, and then I stopped, and he stopped, and then he did a U-turn real fast, but then there was other cars, so I followed him, and the first thing he gets out, and he says, oh, no, don't think I'm trying to outrun you. I was like, well, hello. He was all like, and uh, I'll pay cash for it, I'll pay cash for it. So that tells me one thing is that he doesn't have insurance. <laughs> I'm like, Lord, be doers of the word. And then it even gets better. I was like, give me your insurance. So he gave me the insurance. It was back in 2017. I know he doesn't have insurance. Uh, and then I was like, give me your driver's license. And then he pulls it out. And, oh, I left my driver's license at the house, but I have my ID card. He ain't got no driver's license. So I'm just, you know, tolling up everything, just saying being how to be a Christian in the real world uh you know how to how to show christ in your everyday life and we all have these moments we all have these moments but today we're going to be in the book of james 1 through 19 through 27 and then we're going to just be in this one section it's going to be quite a bit of verses and i'll go ahead and read it then we'll get right into it which is james 1 19 through 27 know this my beloved brothers let every person be quick to hear slow to speak slow to anger For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive the meekness, the the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if even one is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away at once, forgets what he is like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and preserves being no hearers who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not riddle his tongue, but deceives his heart, the person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep one unstained from the world. And... Um, as I continue to study, I want to take a look, first of all, just on some statistics from a, a Christian and a non-Christian. And uh, this statistics were from George Barna. Number one is, and what they define a Christian as, is being born again. You accepted Christ, uh, and you've been born again. You have found Christ as compared to a non-Christian. One out of every three Christians accept the same sex unions or marriage. Having been divorced, born again Christians are at 27%. Born again Christians divorced, 27%. Non Christians, 23%. Gave money to homeless person or a poor person in the past year. A born again Christians, born again Christians, 24% of them have given to the poor in the last year. A non-Christian, 34% of them have given to the poor. Took drugs or medication for depression in the past year. Christians, 7% of them have. Non-Christians, 8%. 
donated money to a pro- nonprofit organization in the past month. Christians, 47% have donated. Non-Christians, 48% of them have donated. So with these statistics, and there's more, I'm just going to stop there. You have to realize, what's the difference between a born-again Christian and a non-Christian in the real world? And then you can even take that father too, is what is a Christian supposed to be? What is it supposed to do? How are they supposed to act? And this is what's something that we're going to be talking about. In this, James, whenever he talks about this, you have to understand that who is he talking to? He is talking to the church. He is talking to the church. Christians... Christians should live in a different fashion from unbelievers with moral alertness and seriousness. We should define ourselves. We should be different. Our actions should be different. And we're going to dissect this. James gives us warnings in this entire passage of about being self de- uh, having leading to self-deception. Hearing, hear the world without doing it leads to self-deception. You're just fooling yourself. Obedience should always be the bottom line of the Bible study or biblical preaching. You have to understand this too, is that one, is that why do we come to church? Why do we come to Sunday school? Why do we go attend a Bible study? Is it so we can put a tally and say, hey, I've done so-and-so. I've read that book. haven't done any of it, but I've read it. What's the purpose of coming to church and Bible study? It's to obedience, to learn something and apply it. Correct application must always be built on correct interpretation of the Bible. So here's going to be some points that you can write down or just look at the screen. James gives us three warnings about just hearing the word. When you just hear the word, there's three warnings that he gives us. First of all, hearers take a quick glance, but don't do anything to fix it. Hearers take a quick glance, but don't do anything to fix what they see. He refers this to as a man looking in the mirror. The example that, you know, I'm going to use, of course, is like, you know, you wake up late for work and then what happens you get up you look in the mirror you see that your face is messed up or something of that nature you don't wash it you just ignore it you just run out the door you don't do anything to fix yourself i know a uh, prom's coming up in a couple months right and every time prom comes up you always get that one pimple right <laughs> the younger ones will so when you're there getting ready for prom and you get that one pimple, what do you do? Oh, that's cute. You do something. You yell, Mom! Right? You try to put makeup or something to cover it. I never did that. <laughs> but you'll try to cover it, correct? You'll try to fix it. When you look in the mirror and you see something wrong, you will fix it. He's explaining this as you see something in the mirror and you don't do anything about it. You don't do anything about it. You don't do anything to fix it. Uh, This goes back to uh, Adam and Eve also. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, they had sin. They were confronted on their sin. And what's the first thing that they do? She did it. It's that woman you gave me, God. Well, Eve, what happened? It's that serpent. They're always blaming. They're always dodging what they need to own up to. Always dodging, always dodging. And my favorite one is, too, here is uh, whenever you hear a good message and you're taking notes for your spouse. Have you ever had that? Have you ever had a message or notes forwarded to you? Or you should read this book. (laughs) It's really good. You understand that the word of God was written for who? For yourself. For yourself. Okay? For yourself. Point two here is what James warns us on is here's only of the word forget what they hear have heard they forget what they hear and with this again james is talking to the church it's not a it's not a memory problem it's a priority problem they just don't want to do it they have things other things on the priority than trying to fulfill what god wants them to do it's a priority problem they forget the word because it's not important to them an example of this what we're going to give is uh, in deuteronomy 6 12 where god warns israel not to forget where they come from. You see, Israel's already in the land. And it says this, Then take care, lest you forget the Lord, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You see, what was happening here is that they were caught up in the land. They weren't paying attention to anything else. They were more worried about the land, and they started filling their hearts with something else besides the word of God. 
If you have children, you probably witness this. How many times have you gone in the room, the room's a mess, correct? There's not one clean room. And you tell your child what? Clean this room. And then you leave, you come back about 30 minutes, and have they done anything? They haven't done anything. And then you tell them, why didn't you clean your room? Oh, I forgot. Right? Anybody else do this or just my daughter? They just forget because it's not a priority. They have other things. They'd rather, you know, they'll pick up one toy and start playing with it because their priorities are different than actually obeying. And this is what God is warning us about. So what do we do as parents? I want this, clean, this room clean within the next 10 minutes or you'll get a bust in if you're in my house. You have to up the consequences. So the question is, where on your priority list is God's word? What relationship do you have with your Bible? At what priority is God's word to you? And the last one that he warns us about is hearers only end up deceiving themselves. James states this in two times in verse 22 and 26, that if you hear the word often and do not put it into practice, you deceive yourself. You deceive yourself. You understand it's not how many times you read the Bible or how many times you've done the Bible study. You haven't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much knowledge you have in your head of this or that or how the Bible works. What matters is how you apply it to your life. Is it better that you read the Bible 10 times or you read one chapter and you put that into practice? Doing the word, doing the word. Mark Twain said this, it isn't the parts of the Bible that I don't understand that bother me, it's the parts that I do understand that bother me. And then I'm going to steal Mr. Simon's uh, saying on this. I heard him say this on the radio. Uh, he says, well, according to the gospel of Tom, that was a foul. <laughs> but you think about that. And he was right. I want to read his whole book. I just haven't found it yet. But uh, you have to think about that. How many times do we put a gospel according to Jacob or the gospel according to your name? Because we just pick certain pieces that we want. You know, and I'm not going to get political here, but the Bible says pray for your leaders, correct? When was the last time we prayed for our leaders, honestly? I don't like what he's doing. I don't like this. I don't like that. So I'm not going to be praying for him. That's your gospel. That's not God's gospel. Pray for your leaders, careless if the person you voted for won or if the person that you didn't vote for won, wins. You pray for your leaders, and that's just an example but there's many things in the Bible that we just take and we just twist it according to us. You know, another one is, you know, uh, submit, woman, you're my wife. See, that's different. In order for the, uh, the woman to, the wife to submit, guess what the man has to do? Submit to Jesus. There's always two folds on that. Always two folds on that. But yet we just try to take pieces in the gospel according to Jacob. Because we interpret it this way and we leave this part out. We, de our, we deceive ourselves as Christians also in our words. And this is the one thing that, of course, you know, God gave us two ears and one mouth, correct? But some of us want to use our mouth more than our ears. If you want to know two tests, if you're trying to deceive yourselves, just listen to the words that come out of your mouth. Have you ever just thought about that? There's sometimes I'll tell my kids, like, I just want to record you right now to play it back tomorrow. You just have to listen to what the words are coming out of you. Are they lines? Are they half truths? Slander? Gossip? Ang angry words? Hateful words? There's even a shirt out there somewhere that says, uh, I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. I mean, if you're applying the word, you should be changing. There should be something different about you. When you speak, you should be speaking differently than the non-Christians, than the, uh, the world itself. There should be something different about you. There should be something different about you. Have you ever met somebody and saying, hey, something's different about them? You just get that one feeling, how they carry themselves or how they speak? It should be, should be different. 
he also talks about, Paul also talks about the blessings that can lead to he, not only hearing the word, but doing the word. Hearing the word and, and acting leads to blessings. There's four points here that if you want blessings, and of course, there's no, everybody wants to be blessed, correct? It takes work to be blessed. Blessed hearers and doers look intently at the word, is what it says in scripture, intently. I want you to understand, too, what the word intently means. Intently means to stoop down. It means to take a closer look. Whenever John and Mary went into the tomb looking for Jesus, it says that they intently looked for him. They stooped down to look for Jesus. They looked closely. Have you ever lost something? You're like, I know it was just here, and you start moving papers, and you start moving everything else. You look deeply. You look deep into it. You intently look at the word. Going back to the mirror, when you look in the mirror, what do you see? Do you intently look at yourself? Because if you also read the Bible, the Bible is a convicting book. If you intently look at it. If you intently look at it. It will point out your sin. And I'm telling you, you know, like when I get tested, God tests me on everything here because I was just thinking, being doers of the word, I have to present myself correctly, I have to do this, I can't yell at them, you know. And he had a whole family watching in this truck, and then, of course, my family was, go, Dad, you know. And we we're having conversations, and you, people are looking. Everybody's looking. You have to see the issues, and you have to fix it. How many of y'all have read a verse or heard someone preach on a verse or in a Bible study, preach a verse, and you're like, hey, I never saw it that way? For one, it's a different overview, but then again, one reason why they're probably more in-depth into it because they intently looked at it. They did a research on it. They did research on it. Sometimes in the Bible, we'll have one word, and you're like, I wonder why they have that one word there. And then you just move on. Why does the book of Matthew start off with the genealogy? How many of us skip the first chapter of Matthew? I can't pronounce those names. Forget it. There's meaning behind it if you would intently look at it. You cannot apply a text that you don't understand. And that's one of the famous ones that I believe, too, that's in this world is that just taking Scripture and just twisting it to the way we want it to be. The second blessing is going to be blessed hearers and doers apply the word not just to his outward behavior, but to his heart. To his heart. I'm going to embarrass my son here in a minute. I have permission to say this. We lived in Pflugerville, and uh, he was a kindergartner. And he's going to school, and uh, uh, he, he gets home, and he was telling me a story, and he goes, uh, you know, they were in the cafeteria having a recess, and then uh, a little girl was coming and, you know, messing with him, and Caleb started running around the gym, and she just started chasing him. So uh, after a recess, the teacher goes up to Caleb and says, Caleb, you know, I'm so proud of you. I'm glad that you played with so-and-so because nobody ever plays with her. And he just kind of sat there and just kind of shook his head, and he was like, and he was telling me, Dad, I was running away from her. I wasn't playing with her. <laughs> <laughs> On the outside, what did the teacher think? Oh, he's so sweet, and he is a sweet boy, but, you know, that you're playing, you know, Caleb's this and that. But on the inside, in his heart, guess what he was doing? Get away. <laughs> Leave me alone. You understand that our outward behavior has to be in our heart. You can do this, and you can show the people that you're here, and you're serving and doing this, but where's the heart? And I'm telling you, this is why I love the youth so much, and they bless me more than I believe that I bless them, is just because I see their heart, I see their passion, their love for Christ, no matter where they're at. Where's your heart? It talks about the perfect law and the law of liberty. You know, once again, James was talking to the Jews, because the Jews were perfect at what? Keeping the law. But they were so far from God. Their hearts were so far. And this is what he's trying to call uh, change. And also the law of liberty is not the old covenant, but the new covenant of grace is what he was talking about, of loving. Take your word to heart. Uh, part of this, too, is going to be, uh, you know, you heard the story of the young rich ruler. He did everything. You know, Jesus, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, I've kept the commandments, what must, what must I do in order to inherit eternal life? Jesus tells him, sell everything and follow me. 
And what happened to the young rich ruler? He left, upset, crying, because he had many, many possessions. If you want to take the word to heart, if you want the word to come to your heart, you're going to have to get everything else out to make room for the word. You see, sometimes what, what clogs our heart, one is sports, money, are the two biggest things that I think in our society right now. Because we have so much stuff in here, we don't have room for God's heart. There's even times at the game I have to hold my tongue, and I'm getting better at it. But you have to understand that you have to clean your heart. You have to get all of that out to fill yourself with the, with the heart, with the word in your heart. I just have 10 more pages, so y'all hang in there. Also, when you apply the uh, word to your heart, the Holy Spirit will free us from sins of bondage. You have to understand that. Whenever you accept the word, you take it to the heart, the Holy Spirit's going to be there to guide us, to protect us, to lead us. But you have to have the word in your heart, just not on the outside, just doing A, B, and C, not the checklist. So the second thing, the third thing that we're going to talk about, the blast is going to be blessed hearers and doers continue to apply the word to his heart continually. We talked about this in Sunday school. Can there be a stuck Christian? Where a Christian says, I've been a Christian for 20 years and my faith is still here. I don't believe so. I believe if you're a true Christian and you're intently looking at the word, you're going to continue to grow. You're intently going to try to apply something. Even if you take uh, one part of a message or one part of a Bible study and you say, I'm going to change this starting this week, you're going somewhere. God is using you. You're continually growing. Sometimes, too, we just want to have a 911 God. In case of emergency, what do we do? Okay, God, where are you at? I need prayer. You know, I need this and I need this and I need this. And y'all pray with me. Everybody pray with me. A 911 God. And then he works a miracle or he fixes it. And then guess what do we do? All righty, make sure you uh, answer next time I call you. Because when you call 911, they're supposed to answer. How many of us have this 911 God? Or do we have a daily God that we go to and search every single day? There's a big difference. The blessed here and doers look intently at the word. He applies it not just to his outward behavior, but also to his heart. He continues applying it over a lifetime. He never stops. He or she will never stop continually doing it. You know, and one great thing, too, is like, you know, I've been blessed by this church uh, many, many times. You know, how many, I'm going to put Miss Bell on the spot. How many of you ever received a cake from her? Ever. There's a lot, right? She makes the best cakes. What if she just said, hey, here's 10 bucks. Go get a cake and make it. Which one means more? Which one means more? You know, and uh, even the cards. Bella loves getting mail. She'll get a mail and she's like, oh, Miss Bell, she already knows. But it's in the heart. It's in the heart. The last point, blessed hearers and doers apply the word so that it changes his conduct and his character in the sight of God. So when you hear the word, you have it in your heart, and you apply it, guess what's going to start changing? Your actions. Your actions. You're going to start bearing fruit. Jesus gives two examples of actions that he calls for. And he, call, he calls it from the, uh, actually it's going to be on verse 27. Religion is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So why would he bring up two examples? One is to visit. The word visit, I want to dissect it into what's called an overseer. Back then, whenever you visited orphans and widows, how much money did you get? Nothing. Nothing. You did it from your heart. You went to go visit them. Not only did you visit them, but you watched over them. You took care of them. You gave them things that they needed. Not for something in return, but because your heart and the word says it. To visit, to be concerned about. 
setting yourself aside and putting others in front of you. And the last one is going to be keep oneself unstained by the world. There are so many things in our world nowadays that can just stain us. And they continue to stain us. And then we allow it. The first thing that I believe that stains us is called the cell phone. Do you realize that we even have a, a idol that we worship? And we don't even know it. And let me, uh, let me read this. I saw this on Facebook somewhere, and it says, what if we treat our Bibles the way people treat our cell phones? And you think about that for a moment. What if we carried the Bible everywhere we went? What if we turned back to our house to get our Bible if we forgot it? What if we checked the Bible for messages throughout the day? What if we used the Bible in case of emergency? What if we spent one hour more using the Bible each day? And you can just think about that. What if we treated our Bible the way we treat our cell phones? We're being stained by the word, uh, world and sometimes we don't even know it. Going back to being stained by the world, one is what kind of TV shows do you watch? Even TV shows that you watch will have an effect on you. Me and my son love uh, Real Steel. That's an older movie. Have any of y'all seen Real Steel? You know, y'all have homework now. Um, it's a great movie, but we love this movie, and at the very end, guess what me and him do? It's, it's kind of like a boxing robots. So at the end of the movie, guess what we start doing? You know? And we try to do the same moves that Adam does. It has an influence on us. How many of y'all watch Rocky and think I can go conquer the world? It has an effect on us. Any TV show, any movie that you watch has an effect on you. Has an effect on you. Even Facebook. Social media. It has an effect on us. There will be times we'll be going through Facebook and then we see a comment and we're like, great. And it just ruins our day. Just based on one post. One post. Don't be stained by the world. So many Christians that live worldly through the TV shows, social medias. See, what, and the example here is that we go in the world and we act like the world. We get stained. We get stained all week. And then we come to church for one hour on Sunday and we expect all the sins to be washed away. You need, one, you need more than one bath a week. You realize that? In order to, and I'm going to try to sum, summarize all of this, trying to put into action what being doers and hear the words mean. And Miss uh, Courtney, can I bug you? You have insurance, right? No? You can sit right here. No, I mean, just right there. And this is not bird box. <laughs> this is something different. Can you see? You sure? Yeah. Turn around. Keep turning, keep turning. Okay, now come over here. And I'm going to put you right here, okay? Now, the object of this is going to be very simple. Do you remember where you're sitting? Yeah. You sure? Get back there. Okay, you can stop there. So what happens? What happens here? Us Christians, whenever we're not doing the word, guess what we're doing as Christians? Let me try this. Let me try to date this guy. Let me try to date this girl. I know the Bible doesn't say that, but let me try. Financial freedom. Well, let me try this instead of listening to God's word. Marriages. Our marriage is in trouble. Guess what we do? Oh, we'll just get by, and we'll just try to fill ourselves around life, trying to make it through our own instead of listening. And this is the difference between listening to God's word. Courtney, can you listen to me? You're going to do everything that I say. You're going to take just about a quarter step to your left. 
right there. Now turn your body to the right until I tell you stop. Stop. Turn to the left just a hair. Right there. Now take two steps forward. Okay, take two more steps forward. Two more steps forward. Let's take two more steps forward. I can tell you're scared. <laughs> two more steps forward, Courtney. Okay, now here you're just going to be maybe just maybe about a half a step. Okay, right there. Now, Courtney, this is why I asked if you had insurance. <laughs> it's been good so far. It's about to get scary. It's up to you to listen to me. If you're willing to listen to me and everything will be fine. Mm -hmm. It's going to get scary. I'm kind of scared for you. Is y'all's hearts pounding too? <laughs> you have to listen intently to the word. You have to. But yet when things get a little scary, guess what we do? We try to take control ourselves. The Bible says what? Marvin, come up here. The Bible says what? In tough times, I will send my spirit. And my spirit will guide you. And my spirit will help you. Take one step down. You're at the steps. And my spirit will be there if you just follow my word. Take another step. I will never leave you or forsake you if you believe in me. Take one more step. And it's scary. It's scary, especially when you can't feel the spirit there. Take one last step. And the Holy Spirit's going to guide you to the seat. If you follow the word and have a seat, you can take it off. And as a band comes up here, this is the demonstration that I want to tell you, Christians, is that one is that, in my opinion, what grows a church is every single one of you. Every single one of you. You see, yes, I'm a pastor of Flicks, a pastor. We're expected to be there during our funeral. We're expected to be there to pray. We're expected to be in a Bible study. But what if you started doing the word in your office, at your workplace, within your business, and someone comes up and says, Simon, something's different about you. What's different? It's God. Come to church. If I invite one person, guess what? We have like 171 people. If each one of you invited one person, imagine that. So as I, as I leave you here, and I want to challenge you on just a couple things. One, being doers of the word, the first thing is, is do you know where you're going? Heaven is real and hell is real. There's no in between. Do you know where you're going? If you don't, please come see me. Please come see me. The second challenge I have you on is that you may already be born again, and maybe you're stuck somewhere, or just take one thing and start applying it to your life. Take that one item, take that one scripture, whatever it may be, and start applying it to your life. And the third thing I want to challenge you on is just worship. I want to give you an example, too. You know, like this is the altar, and I've been here a year, and I, I, me personally, am surprised that this altar isn't used more. The altar is a place of defeat, but it's a defeat from ourselves. Just because you come to the altar doesn't mean things are bad. It also means something's good, and I'll give you a perfect example. There's one picture in the newspaper that I saw Coach Delosier. He was standing up, and all his players were on their knee. Why? They had just won. Everything's great. It's because the players knew that Coach Delosier had wisdom, and he's going to speak upon them. He has something to say, and what he's going to say is important. That's why they took a knee. Sometimes life is great, and we have to come to the altar and just take a knee before our Father and just say, Father, life is good. Just give me some wisdom. Help me grow.